I want to thank you for what you have done to reach out to some people. We have a ministry that we have participated in called The Shoe That Grows, and we're going to pass some of these around. You guys go ahead if you've got one. They come in pink and brown, and we started this during Vacation Bible School, and just this week, we got a thank you note that just touched me, and then I got another thank you note from another ministry, and I said, you know what? I get these thank yous all the time, but so many times I forget to read them to you, and you don't get to hear the thanks. So if you're not familiar with this ministry, The Shoe That Grows, it is a fantastic ministry that instead of just buying shoes for impoverished countries and they wear out or they grow out of them in, in six months or a year. These, and you'll see they go by, these last for up to five years. They're adjustable and they're high quality and they're awesome. And we got a thank you note from this practical compassion ministry that said, thank you so much, Potter's Hand. You participated in this ministry with us. $750 was sent by you guys. Every dollar of that went to help Shoe those people who don't even have the simple luxury of being able to walk without their feet getting cut up. And you guys did that. And every time they give these shoes, the gospel is presented. It's not about just being good because we're good people. It's all about pointing people to the good shepherd. That's why we are good. It's because he is good. He first loved us. So I want to thank you for that. They were so excited to be able to give these out. And they sent me this thank you note. And then I got another one. So that was overseas. This is over here. There's a group of people always standing on the wall, always defending us, always fighting for our freedom. But a lot of times, family members are left behind, and they're often overlooked. So there's a ministry that deals with loving the spouses of those who serve overseas, those who stand on the wall, those who protect our freedoms. And I got a letter from one of the care package recipients that you sent, that you helped fund through our golf tournament that we have every year. I want to thank Kevin and Elliot for putting that together through the silent auction that happens. We raised enough money that not only did we benefit from it as a church, we got to select two or three other charities to bless. That is cool. Here's their thank you letter. I don't really know what to say. My husband was deployed, and for the first time, the loneliness came crashing in. I was going through a lot emotionally, and when I received the care package that you had paid for and you had sent, I snuck out to my car and I cried. Someone was thanking me, a spouse. Someone was thinking of me, a spouse. Someone was thinking and acknowledging me. That meant so much. You have no idea how much I felt so alone, so scared during my husband's deployment. Thank you for making me feel loved, appreciated, and supported. Thank you for simply remembering us, the families of those who serve overseas. And every time we send out a care package, it has a Bible, and it contains a separate book solely about the life of Jesus. And that is awesome, because we are giving more than just pampering stuff and things that minister to their physical needs. We're also trying to meet their spiritual needs. And you did that. And they send a thank you note, and it says, we thank God for you. Thank you, Potter's Hand, for all you do for our military families. You're such a vital part of our ministry. We couldn't do it without you. God bless. God love you. Sincerely, Dr. Steve and Diane Rumley. That's pretty awesome. What you don't know is overseas, around the country, but here locally, just this past week, because of your generosity, because of your faithfulness, we were able to help a church family out that was having, let's just say it was one of those series of unfortunate events, and it was one thing after another. And financially, they had nothing. And when their car broke down, and they scraped together just enough they thought to get it running, the very next day, their other vehicle broke down. We found out about it, and we were able to step in and get both cars repaired. We were able to step in and help a family who was in danger of losing their home, being evicted. These are good people here in our midst. It's not always nameless, faceless people. Because of your faithfulness, we were able to step in when we found out about it and stop that eviction. We were able to also help another family whose sole transportation was their dependent for their job that was about to be repossessed. And we were able to find out about it. And because of you and your generosity, we stepped in and said, that car will not be repossessed. We will pay it. And we were able to because of you. That is awesome. That is being a light. That's just not just, you know, hey, let's just be nice and group hug. You're actually putting your money where your mouth is. And y'all, I am so proud of you. You have no idea what that makes me feel like as your pastor. I'm so grateful for you. Please keep up the great work. You guys are awesome. This is not the norm. Trust me, I meet with pastors all over, and they complain, and they talk about things and say, well, man, well, you know, Pastor Matt, you're, I'm like, I don't know, because <laughs> it's not like that at my church. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you. God bless you for your generosity, for your spirit. It ministers not only to people out there, it ministers to me. And I love you, and I appreciate you. Can I pray for you begin, as we begin our worship? God, we thank you that you are so good to us. You have blessed us. Thank you for the privilege to worship you, to have the freedom we enjoy. God, you are so good to us. It is a privilege to return just a, a portion of what you blessed us with. Week after week, you are faithful. We declare our love for you, our dependence on you. And Lord, today as we gather, Lord, we just want to worship you, to pull off the expressway and just linger in your presence today, to sing to you, to hear your word proclaimed, to hug like-minded believers, to form your church today. God, would you visit us? Would you let this be a sweet time? Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And that's what we're talking about today as we talk about sheep. Because sheep wander. Woo! Yes, they do. Anybody ever feel their heart wander from time to time? Or you came to the right place? Because today we're talking about diving into those deep green pastures that God leaves for us. He leads us to them. So let me ask a question. Let's take a poll here. Let's just see how many of us truly need rest, soul restoration. By a show of hands, how many would say that last night, like most nights, they got a fantastic night of sleep and couldn't wait to hit the ground running this morning? Six people. <laughs> exactly, right? Agree or disagree with this statement? Let's, just, let's, let's, let's take it further. Not just last night, but in life general. Agree with this statement or disagree? By and large, I sleep phenomenally. I am well rested in life, and I can't wait to take on the day every morning. Agree? Disagree. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. I, my hand's up on the disagree. Okay? So you're safe here. It's okay. There is no shame in it. Yes, Randy? I see that hand. The altar is open. You can come anytime. This is where we're at. This is the pace of life. This is life at, you know, the speed of technology. It is crazy, and there is so much pulling on us. Let's be honest. Most of us, if we're being very, very candid, will admit at least sometimes burning the candle at both ends, right? And that's just, that's just kind of a, an unwritten rule of life. So I have good news and I have bad news for you. Which do you want first? I always give you the good news first. I'm going to give you the bad news first. The bad news is when we live like this, when we're constantly on the go and we are burning the candle at both ends, we don't resemble the shepherd. That's the bad news. And we're not a great example for the lost and watching world. But there's good news. The good news is you don't have to live like that. Hear me. Somebody needs to hear this today. Write this down. God never called you to burn the candle at both ends. Thank you, Lord. He never called us to burn the candle at both ends. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere in Scripture will you see the spiritual gift of burnout. It's not there. You can look for it. But you can't, oh, I have the gift of tongues, and I have the gift of healing, and I have the gift of prophecy. I have the gift of burnout. You, Paul never ran around proclaiming that. Peter wasn't championing that. Y'all need to burn out. Woo! But sometimes we wear it like a badge of honor. The dark circles under our eyes, the sleepless nights, and the, the lagging in our step. Oh, I just pulled another all-nighter. Bless God, don't I look redeemed? <laughs> Who wants to be like me? Right? And that's where we're at. Psalm 23 addresses this, and it lays out a beautiful map for us of what awaits us if we take the time to follow the good shepherd into the green pastures. And it is so rich. Six simple verses. We looked at one or two of them a couple weeks ago when I last spoke. And we're going to look at it a lot more today. When we follow him, when we seek him first, when we order our day, when we take dominion over our schedules and we order our priorities and the priorities of our families, our children, our parents, when we do that, we can rest and we have a lifestyle that is so amazing. Something miraculous happens here. If you've ever been around someone who was a ticking time bomb, they didn't have a short, they didn't have a, a long fuse, okay? But when we spend time in the green pastures with the shepherd, whether that's corporately together here at church, whether that's in your small group, whether that's in your Bible time at home with the Lord alone, when you start resembling the shepherd, you will find that you have a long fuse. You are long-suffering. You know what long-suffering means? 
just a fancy word for patient. Anybody need a little more patience? Anybody's fuse a little short? See, when we have a long fuse like this, not only are we long-suffering, we start looking like fruit. Fruit that you might recognize like gentle and full of kindness and self-control and patience. Y'all recognize that list? That's what the master has called us. We want to have this long fuse. But if we're being honest, if we don't follow the shepherd, this is not what we look like. This is what we look like. We have a short fuse, and we are just seconds away from exploding. A ticking time bomb. Maybe this isn't your fuse. Maybe, maybe that is your fuse. <laughs> Right? And you are just, if one person comes up and says one more word, I'm just, boom, we explode like a stick of dynamite. If one person cuts me off in that traffic again and refuses to use their turn signal, I'm going to lose it. Yes, thank you. I hear those amens. I'm glad it's not just me. We have a short fuse. We have a short fuse. We don't resemble the good shepherd. We can have the secret, though, of having a long fuse, of being long-suffering, of being patient, of being restored. I want to thank my good friend, Pastor Donnie. I got to have a Sunday off last week, and I got to go to the north side of Raleigh and listen to him. And he was preaching a message totally unrelated to this, but he used these. And I said, I got to go talk to that guy. And I went, I said, where did you get those? He goes, you want them? I said, yeah, this is perfect. That's what I'm preaching on next week is how, how God does it. And he's like, here, take them. So thank you, Donnie. If you're ever watching this, God bless you. This is the perfect illustration for us. So let me ask this as we begin. How long is your fuse today? Don't answer out loud. Don't point to your spouse. How long is your fuse? Is it this? Is it here? Or is it somewhere in between? Because today we're going to be able to follow the great shepherd into the green pastures and see what he has for us. If your soul needs restoring today, you are in great shape because this is what we're going to do. Before we read this, the scripture, let me set the context. Psalm 23, most people, most scholars tend to agree, David wrote this after he had become king. Now, he was a shepherd, and he knew all about this, but this is sometime after he became king, and he's had enough of a rough patch because, let's be honest, his pathway to being coming king was not smooth, and his kingship was not smooth, partly his own fault, but he had some issues to deal with, some big times of wandering, shall we say. But yet he still felt compelled and knowledgeable enough about his shepherd days that he looked up at the good shepherd and thought of him as the way he shepherded David. David wrote this psalm for us. And he had these amazing words, the most famous ones, the Lord is my shepherd. And we see why he would write this. Now, to get us thinking about this, I knew I'd be talking about sheep. I reached out to a farm and we've arranged to have three live sheep brought in. So they're going to come down the center aisle right here, and we're going to look. I'm just kidding. Look at you all turning. <laughs> That'd be cool, wouldn't it? I did try. I did. I, I wasn't able to do it, but uh, you're going to be able to, to put this together really, really powerfully. Turn to Psalm 23, and as you pull that up, let me welcome those who are streaming today. It's good to have you with us. I'm going to be reading from the New King James today. If you have your app and you want to lock in your translation with me, the NKJV. Let's read starting, we're going to read the whole thing, all six verses, starting in verse one. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. I love that. We'll come back to that. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love verse 3. I love that. He restores my soul. We need soul restoration. You don't have to look far. You don't have to look far outside of Apex, let alone looking in Charlottesville or, or other cities to where you see this planet desperately needs soul restoration. Do you realize, let me ask this, how many people have ever been to a spa? You ever been to a spa? There's no shame in that. All these girls, they don't want to say, it's okay, man, I'd love to go. It looks really, really relaxing and fun. Did you know that in 2003, there were less than 10,000 spas in the entire country? Fast forward to 2015, guess how many there are now? 
It has more than doubled, yes, 21,000 spas, all trying to restore people. If you could summarize just, just one word of our nation of what we need, it would probably be restoration. It would probably be some kind of healing where people are desperately looking, sometimes in the wrong spot, for restoration. Did you know it is now a $3.7 trillion industry? $3.7 trillion, not billion, not billion, trillion. That's a big number. I don't even know how big that is. That's a lot of zeros. Do you think that indicates where we are? Absolutely. And this is not just a 21st century problem. David needed soul restoration too. He cried out and he says, Lord, I need you to restore my soul. His was the result of possibly secret sin that was soon to become no longer secret. What about you? Are you struggling? Is your soul restoration needed because you are simply living in a fallen world? If so, all right, you're in good company. Is it because you're going through a rough patch? Maybe some bad circumstances, maybe some tragedy, maybe some horrible news came your way. That's understandable. Is it the result of maybe some secret sin that has been plaguing you and nagging and sapping the spiritual vitality out of your walk with Christ? Well, you know, that, that's okay. We've, we've been there. It's not wrong to experience that. It's wrong to stay there. Jesus can break those chains. Hear me. You need to hear that hope. We are all in this together. And the good shepherd says, I know your problems. I understand. Come, get alone with me, and I will restore your soul. We serve a mind-blowing creator who doesn't just say, hey, I know where green pastures are. They're that way. <laughs> he doesn't just point the way. He leads us. That's what a shepherd does. It is amazing. Y'all, it's going to blow your mind, the symbolism. You ever been to a hardware store? And you don't know where the, the left-handed muffler bearings are? You're like, what, what aisle is that on? And you're not really sure, so you go up and you ask the guy, and you go, hey, where's, where's the... Where's the uh, blinker fluid. I need to refill my, my turn signal fluid. And he's like, oh, they're taught not to just point the way. Did you notice that? If you've ever been to Lowe's or, or, or Home Depot or some of these stores or, or Disney World even, you say, where's such and such? They are taught to lead you. And they take you to the place. In fact, if they point, that's a no-no. They're taught you don't ever put that finger out. You lead them. How much more does our good shepherd lead us? And say, yeah, it's down there. It's I think it'll be okay. He leads us. The God of the universe wants to lead us into his pleasant, soul-restoring pastures? Wrap your mind around that. What other faith dares even claim that? That is so awesome. Psalm 23 outlines more things that we can expect from our, our shepherd here. And every single verse of these next six reveals a new characteristic of how he declares his love and his care for us. The very first one we see right out of the bat is that he is our personal shepherd. He's our personal shepherd. Look at verse 1. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. Think about that. That's critical. David could have said, the Lord is a shepherd, but he didn't. He could have said, the Lord is one of many shepherds, but he didn't. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. This involves a personal relationship. Don't miss this. If you don't have that personal relationship, none of these other six steps apply to you. These are the key. This part right here, the Lord is my shepherd. So let me ask this. I'm not going to wait for the challenge at the end. Do you have that? Do you have that personal relationship? Do you know the shepherd? If not, you can today. Please come talk to me. Find a staff member. We would love to share how to get in touch with the good shepherd. Everything depends on that, okay? As Charles Stanley would write, he said, the reason why God knows exactly what you need and can be your personal shepherd is because he is all-knowing. He's the only one who is omniscient. He knows what you lack, and he knows how to provide it. He can provide your physical, your emotional, spiritual needs. And that's the next step. He is our providing shepherd. Now, here's the deal. When we think that, we think, oh, he's going to provide everything we want. That's not what it says. We love to so personalize this that we make it like a cosmic wish list. And again, hear me. If that's what you want, you don't want a shepherd. You want a Santa Claus. There's a huge difference. It doesn't say he will provide everything we want the way we want it in the time we want it. This is so critical. We know, based on the shepherd, he will do what's best, wait for it, for advancing the kingdom. Notice what I didn't say. This is not popular today, by the way. I didn't say he will do what's best for you. Well, pastor, that, that offends me. 
Well, you know what? That's a good indicator something's wrong. Because it's so easy for us to make everything about us, for us to take the God of the universe and wrap him around us and wrap him around our life. Well, it's all about me. No, it's not. It's all about him. He's the shepherd. When you get to be the shepherd, you make the rules. Right now, this is his shepherding. This is his pasture, the God of the universe. He wants what's best for you, but it doesn't always wrap itself in our feeble mind where we understand what he's doing. We are so me-focused rather than God-focused, and it is so easy in our culture to put ourselves on the throne of our heart instead of Christ on the throne of our heart. Know what I'm saying? Man, our culture, everything, everything in us, everything bombards us with, you need this, you need that, you need more, you need that, consume, consume. You need. Sometimes I just want to scream and say, no, I just need him. Just give me Jesus. Give me the one thing I can't get anywhere else. That's what I love about our church. It's so simple. We sing passionate, simple songs. We're not doing the fog machines and the Cirque du Soleil dancers swimming on hula hoops and all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Just give me Jesus. If I want that other stuff, I'll go to Nashville. <laughs> I'll go to Hollywood. You know what I'm saying? I'll go to Vegas. But he is our providing shepherd, and he is the one who provides what we need. The next thing you see, if you look at verse 3, is he becomes our pathfinding shepherd. He's the one who guides us. The verse says, read it with me, he restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. Here it is. For my sake. No. For his name's sake. It's all about him. In humility, may we always be reflectors, just angled up to reflect the sun. That's our job. It's not to bring ourselves glory, not to build our own empires. It's to magnify him. Jesus said his sheep hear his voice, and they follow him. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Y'all remember that in John 10? And I talked about the shepherds, and there was a guy who went to Israel, and he actually watched this. Two flocks came to the well at the same time, and something horrible happened. They began to mingle. And all the sheep got all cattywampus and all mixed up in hibbity doo And you think that'd be a big problem, right? What are you going to do now? Because me, with my lack of shepherding skills, go, big problem. They don't have collars on. I don't have a beeper. There's no way to get them out. Guess what happened? All the shepherd had to do was call out. And he began to walk, and they all followed the shepherd out of the, 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 the feeding area. I think Ryan's got a picture of it here. There it is. It's beautiful. What a perfect picture. Church, don't miss this. This is so simple, but it's so profound. When the shepherd calls, his sheep are supposed to follow. Do we? When God calls you or he convicts you and says, hey, psst, I need you to change that. Do we follow the shepherd? Well, we're supposed to. When he whispers to our heart, says, hey, I need you to change this about you. I need you to go talk to your neighbor about me. I need you to invite that person to that small group because they're, they're really struggling. Do we do it? Do we obey? Well, we're supposed to. That's what it means to be following our pathfinder. I mean, it's just, it's just what he says. This is exactly how we're supposed to respond to our shepherd. He always leads us to the perfect place. And, of course, we all obediently follow, and we go right along, and we never miss a beat following. No. Now, the truth is, this is where it gets very practical for us today. The truth is, sometimes we as sheep are prone to wander. And we look at greener pastures and we think, oh, hey, that pasture's a little greener. Or that pasture's a little greener. Or, oh, my goodness, everything is greener than where God has me right now. And we buy into the lie, and it is a lie that the grass is always greener on the other side. When the truth of it is, the grass is greener where you water it. Let that sink in. This does, I'm not just talking about our marriages, although that certainly applies. Those who have a wandering eye, those who are hurting, and, they're looking, and they always buy into this lie because that's what the culture sells us. That, well, you know, if I just had her, or you know what, it'd be different. Oh, well, the grass is greener. Well, you know what? A lot of times the grass is greener over there because they watered it. A lot of times we need to ask ourselves, are we doing what it takes? Are we properly tending to our own marriage? If so, man, I bet the grass is flourishing. Are you starting to believe the lie that the grass is greener in another pasture? It's not just married people. Students, young people, what about your relationships? What about your friendships? Are you always 
to that point of discontentment where you're looking to upgrade to that, oh, if I could just be with that group of friends, or if I could just break into that clique, well, then I'd be accepted. Then I'd be cool. If I just talked about Jesus a little less, maybe they won't think I'm such a weirdo, such a freak. No. Follow the shepherd. Are we discontent? This happens at single people, same thing. And let's not forget all of us when it comes to climbing the professional ladder. Job hopping. I won't even go into church hopping. But let's just talk about job hopping. Always greener somewhere else. If I could just have that job, if I could just work for that company, if I could just, and we spend our lives climbing up this ladder, trying so hard to find contentment so we could get more stuff and more toys and stuff our lives full of more, more, more. And finally, we think we're going to keep up with the Joneses, and we think we've arrived, and we look in the Joneses' windows, and we see it's, it's been rented out. That house, Joneses have moved. They're not even in their neighborhood. They lived in a gated community now. You can't follow them. You see what I'm saying? It's like one of those things. It's, it's, that, it's that elusive mirage you reach for, it and it's not there. You climb this ladder. You're like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be, oh, if I could just reach just this next level. And we struggle, and we sweat 40 years, and we get to the top, and we go, uh-oh. And there's like this little guy who everybody's left, and he's eating an Oreo, and he's like, oh, I'm sorry. But that ladder, you climbed the wrong one. That's the ladder you should have climbed. What? Are you kidding me? What? I'm climbing up a mountain, and I spent my whole life, and I get to the top, and just when I think it's in sight, you say, sorry, wrong mountain, go climb that one. No. Why do we find our contentment in such shallow, shiny trinkets when God is the only thing that will supply our needs and give us that fulfillment? We need that reminder. Church, that's what, I know it's not popular, but this is so important to us. Just when you believe the grass is always greener, you hop the fence and you land. You're like, woohoo, here we, oh no. <laughs> this grass is dead. Boy, it sure looked different when I was on the other side. And you realize they still got to water it. They still got to tend it. They still got to mow it. They still got to fertilize it. Bloom where you're planted. Perhaps God's got you there for a reason. Before you jump ship, ask him. Shepherd, have you led me here? Are you my pathfinder because you want me in this moment for this purpose? Maybe you're more mature than that, and you, your grass isn't green on the other side, and you, you, you realize that, but maybe you're the other sheep that's prone to wander. Or you just take your eyes off the shepherd just for a minute, just this one sin, just this one time, I'm going to take my eyes off the shepherd, and then that one time becomes two and three, and pretty soon you've strung it together, and your eyes are no longer not just not on the shepherd, they're somewhere else altogether. And you have gotten your eyes off the shepherd, and you've wandered off into some crazy pasture that you're like, how did I get here? I'm speaking to somebody right now. And you wonder, Lord, I'm lost. When did I take my eyes off you so long that I could find myself in this field? Y'all, this, I am living this every day because I have a young little girl named Mercy, and that's what I need. Some mercy in my life because we have entered a new phase in the Mitchell household. Mercy has gone mobile. She is absolutely on fire, crawling everywhere. And I'm not talking about crawling like, oh, isn't it so cute? We can all keep up. She has a whole different gear that I've never seen. It is called Sonic Turbo Boost. Yeah, I'm, I'm not kidding. I set her down, I tie my shoe, I look her, and she's gone. Unfortunately, I did not know she was mobile a couple weeks ago. When my wife brought her to me, very sweetly, as she always does, says, I need to go upstairs. Can you watch Mercy for a minute? Huh? Yeah, sure. Got it. Amy goes upstairs, not even thinking. I set Mercy down. Y'all, it couldn't have been I'm five seconds. And I hear a scream from the top of the stairs, honey, Seriously? <laughs> you know what it's, I knew immediately I was in trouble I didn't just know why yet but I knew something was wrong I was like yeah so what, what is it babe I look down there's no mercy I look around the corner there's no mercy mercy had gone mobile and she had crawled not just away from me through the family room to the first landing of stairs but had crawled up the stairs which oh Oh, there's so much wrong with that. Safety pup, that makes my heart sad to think about how she could have fallen. Gets to the top, turns, and goes up. Mercy found mommy. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, you know the end of this story. 
I was guilty. I did not pay attention. My sheep had wandered from the pen. The shepherd was not doing his job. I freely confess that. Now, with that sheep wandering off, did I grab the rod and the staff and go and beat on my sheep? Negative. Negative. And just like that, God doesn't beat us when we wander, when we're willing to come back with a repentant heart. Thankfully, mercy came back, and Amy was very gentle. She did not beat me or rebuke me in any way. It was a beautiful day, and, and thank you. God bless you for that. And just like that, God doesn't beat us. He doesn't come at us with a, with a mean scowl and a club to club us and say, bad sheep, what are you doing? Just boom, you know. What does he do? Well, according to Luke 15, he rejoices. He picks up the sheep, and he's so happy when one comes home, and he goes and he looks for it. What an awesome shepherd. So much better than I am for my little sheep. And that leads us to the next point. The next quality of our shepherd is he is a protecting shepherd. I love this about him. This is probably my favorite quality. This is probably, and maybe one day I'll explain to you why I think this is so important. Verse 4 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Every one of us will walk through the dark valley. Every one of us. If it hasn't yet, you will. There will be something coming your way. But this is telling us no matter what thunderstorm comes your way, no matter what tempest, the shepherd is with you. He measures what he's allowing to come your way. And he apparently believes you can handle the storm you are in because he is beside you. Here's here's the deal. Don't, Don't miss this. When we keep our eyes on him, we're able to persevere. And we're able to come out the other side of whatever storm you're in and display godliness to a watching world. You ever know somebody like that who's gotten a horrible diagnosis? Maybe a good friend who's just found out they had cancer and they've gone through six, eight months of chemo, radiation, and they just seem to go through it with such poise and grace. Or maybe they lost a family member. Maybe a parent has buried a child. No parent should have to do that. Maybe they, but you've watched their faith and you've watched them come through the other side and you look at them and you are just amazed. And the watching lost world is looking at that. They are seeing incredible poise and integrity and grace. And they're watching and saying, what God do you serve that you can get through like that? And they radiate that godly factor. You know somebody like that? And those people are rare, but I guarantee you they are the first ones that are going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Because in the dark times, you kept your eyes on me, the shepherd. You didn't falter. Staff. The staff's the simple one. That's the one that he comes and he just kind of gently nudges the shepherd. Says, you're straying. Come back over here. Back this way. But there's another thing. Oh, the rod. The rod is a two-foot-long oak club. And it's not very dissimilar from a modern small baseball bat. You know what this is for? It's not for the sheep. It's for those who would dare come against the sheep. Oh, this is so good. This protects the sheep in a way you recognize. You remember when you were a kid? Or maybe you got a kid, and they hear something that scares them. You're walking down a dark road or something, and they're a few feet away. What's the first thing they do? They run, and they come up, and they grab your hand. And they look up, and they know they're safe. Because they know anything that comes against them has got to get through that person holding my hand. You know what I'm talking about? When I was a kid, there were some bullies on my street. They lived down at the cul-de-sac. I'm not bitter about it. I've forgiven them. <clears throat> and they, why are you laughing at that? I, <laughs> they would chase me. And I would run. And I wasn't the fastest guy. And I would run, and I would be running and running and thinking, Dear sweet baby Jesus, I'm about to die. And then I saw my two older brothers. And I am hightailing it. And when I see them, I don't even have to get right in it. I stop immediately and I turn. And I am instantly brave. (laughs) Why am I instantly brave? Because I got big bad Jeff on that shoulder and super fast strong Tim on that shoulder. And I am instantly, I stopped running. In fact, not only am I no longer fearful, if I'm being honest, I'm suddenly a little obnoxious. <laughs> and I go up, I'm like, what you do? What, you, you, where are you going? 
What's, what was that you were saying? You were chasing me a minute ago. I don't see you anymore. Oh, that's right. You're gone. Why? Because I felt safe. Because I ran and I had my two big brothers right there. And I knew those little punks had to get through them to get to me. Know what I'm saying? And I felt safe. Just like that, guys. God has our back. He has your back. This is so, this is so amazing to me. You, you need to get this. This is the beautiful lesson for us. Anything, any enemy that tries to come your way must first get through your shepherd. That is a beautiful truth, and somebody needed to hear that today. Anything that comes at you must get through the good shepherd first. Let that sink in. What a beautiful, beautiful Here's something I learned just this week as I was researching this for you guys. I learned that every night the shepherd counts each sheep. One by one as they come into the fold, into that little holding pen, and they count. You know what he does? After they get in, he puts his own rod, his own staff across the thing to do the head count, making sure each and every one is safe. They hear his voice. It's a calming time. It's a beautiful thing. I never knew that. Every single one. He makes sure. And then he puts his own staff in front to guarantee their safety while they rest. What a picture for us. Which leads us to the last truth today. He's a preparing shepherd. He prepares for us. Look at verse 5. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies? What in the world? Who would do that? You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Just like in ancient times, when guests would come in the house and they would anoint their head with oil, the shepherd anoints us. He is, Christ is welcoming us to come sit down and enjoy fellowship with him. Not some rare special occasion, not Christmas at Easter, not when we do Lord's Supper, not when we have a big hoodoo, but every single time you find yourself in a threatening situation. God says he prepares a table in the presence of his enemies. Do you know what that means? This is so, unless you know the original Hebrew, you missed this. The, the phrase literally indicates that he is preparing Yahweh a table inside the tent with enemies all around the tent, but you are safe inside that flap. The doors have closed. This is the picture that's painted. And no one can get in. No wolves, no bullies from the cul-de-sac, nobody. You are safe. And it's almost like a laughing matter. Like, let's break bread together and we will laugh that the hounds cannot get you. It's a, a, a picture of joy. How cool is that? I never realized that till I see this. What a beautiful picture. Spending time alone with him in his word through prayer, our cup is filled to overflowing. You know that. Sometimes when you leave here, I could see you guys are three feet off the ground. You're floating. You're talking. In fact, sometimes you don't even leave. And that's cool. I'll stay as long as you want. There were churches who would give their eye teeth to have people want to linger and love people. That is awesome. You feel that way. You know why your cup's overflowing? Because you've been with Jesus. And you've had that koinonia fellowship that restores our soul. That's why it is so critical. The benefits of following our shepherd are summed up in verse 6. It says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You want to see something cool? This is a hidden gem. Everything good that God does for us is covered in that one verse. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That takes care of our daily, our daily living, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Hebrew word forever basically says length of days. That's what that's translated as. You know what that means? That means going from this life straight into the next without any lapse of protection or providence. God covers you. Remember Enoch, a godly man, one of the few, one of two actually, that said he walked with God and never died? He walked with God and then God took him. He was no more. That's what length of days means. In this life and the life to come, a complete umbrella of protection. And that's what you have if you know the shepherd. So do you know him? Because you can. Everything here. If you've ever had a chance to watch a real shepherd with his sheep, you'll notice something really striking, really, really strange. It's different from most other livestock. The shepherd is always out in front of the sheep. Think about that. He's never behind them. He's not like a cattleman. They drive cattle. A shepherd is in front. He is leading the sheep. The sheep follow where the shepherd goes. It is a beautiful, beautiful illustration. He is willing. He will not force us. He will not drive us against our will. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He 
He will never force himself on you. That's why you must be the one to accept the good shepherd's invitation. You can do that right now. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you didn't leave us wandering lost forever, but that you made a way, that you became our good shepherd, and you showed us the way back to the pasture. God, thank you. Lord, thank you. I I can't even imagine what life would be like without knowing you. It's hard enough to get through day to day with you, Lord. It just blows my mind how so many people would reject your love. God, I thank you that so many of us in this room today have accepted that. Lord, for those who haven't, I pray that you would soften their hearts, that they would speak to me or somebody today before they leave, and that they would know you as shepherd, as savior, as Lord, as redeemer, as friend. God, would you work on our hearts? We give you this time. Do what only you can do in Jesus' name.